Our sermon title today, Moving Closer to God, from Mark 2, verses 1 through 5. And I've been thinking about this topic for quite some time. And it really, uh, I'm relating it this morning to a famous story about Jesus healing a paralyzed man 2,000 years ago in a town called Capernaum. You might know the story by heart. If you don't, that's okay. Keep listening because it has a bit to do with the forgiveness of sins, being prepared to follow God at any cost, and a whole lot to do with the type of perseverance that is required to do both of those things. And this is the source scripture. This is a, a representation that I kind of like of what we're about to read. So this is Mark 2, 1 through 5, and it says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. So can you imagine that? Somebody wants to see you so bad that they dig a hole in your roof and, and lower someone into the house, right? Uh, let's say Linda and Pat are having dinner one night. Maybe they lock the doors. They hear the chainsaw <laughs> in the roof and someone gets lowered down, right? Or Bruce and Heidi are doing something around the house and all of a sudden there's somebody coming. It's just interesting, okay? Interesting to me. Love this story. It'll hurt, right? Hopefully. So now what else struck me about the scripture immediately was the fact that the four men who carried this person stopped at nothing to get their friend to see this rabbi guy who was going up and down, uh, traveling up and down the coast, telling people about the kingdom of heaven and healing people. And so there was uh, seemingly at least little or no thought of their own well-being, only a singular desire to bring this man face to face with the Son of God, even if it's through the roof of a thatch hut. And it's not every day that that happens. And so it struck me right away uh, how a good portion of people in our country today will act like this with the same uh, passion and vigor, but sometimes for different reasons, sometimes not to meet Jesus, right? And so, for example, in a few short months, we're entering into college football season again, right? But who's counting? And there are important games that are going to come up. And consider, for example, how much trouble the average sports fan will go to in order to get tickets to see the big game of their favorite team, right? I'm trying to think back to what um, uh, Super Bowl tickets cost, for example. I, I can't bring the number up right now, but even the nosebleeds, even the cheap seats were like four or five grand, right? I mean, just crazy. And so how much money they might shell out for that or the amount of money someone might pay to make sure that they end up at the right venue uh, to enjoy the right concert by the right band. Uh, and to many, many people, entertainment and sports or popular culture, it's king, okay? And, and scalpers, they can make a lot of cash standing outside of one of these concerts or one of these event centers. Uh, 200 bucks a ticket, no problem, I'll take three or four, right? But these four men in Capernaum, whoever they were, demonstrated this same type of devotion, not to, not to see anything, not to go to a concert, not to watch a sporting event, but to bring them face to face with the Christ, the Messiah, something pure and good and not tarnished. Uh, by worshiping idols. No, they had their sights set on God straight away, and they looked only to Jesus. So I want to take a moment now and, and think back to, uh, some of you might be high school sweethearts, some of you might have met in a different circumstance, and that's okay, but think back to the dating <laughs> phase, right? When we were younger and dating, um, and it was really, really exciting, right? And the first thought in your head when you woke up in the morning was that your significant other, your partner. Um, and then, uh, so when my wife and I, we were dating, and she remembers this, I'm sure. So we would spend like Friday night, and we'd stay up talking all night till two or three in the morning, and then Saturday night, two or three in the morning, Sunday night, two or three in the morning. Uh, great conversations, it was awesome. Time would fly by like that. And then when Monday morning came around to go back to work, uh, my wife would just slog herself into the office, and I would call in sick. 
and get the rest I needed, right? Remember this? Yeah. Yes. It was so funny because then she'd call my office phone and I she'd get the message. I'm out of the office today, and you know. Um, but the point is, she we were the first thing on each other's minds. Okay, that that was our singular desire. And so uh, that, that is how these four people, I think, felt about getting their friend to meet Jesus. Whatever it takes, we will go through the ceiling. He is our first thought in the morning, whatever it takes. And so the second thing I learned from the scripture was the fact that they really did show an amazing faith. Remember, verse 5 says that Jesus noticed this fact as well. And so these men did whatever it took, which meant going as far as cutting that hole in the roof if they could simply meet Jesus. But then that wasn't the only thing. The second thing was they knew that Jesus would take care of the rest. They had faith that all of that trouble, all of that work would not go to vain, be in vain. So imagine that. And the specifics didn't matter. They were going to get their friend as close to Jesus as possible, no matter how they did it, through the front door, through the back door, through the roof. Who cares? And in fact, you'll note that this act of faith was rewarded immediately by Jesus. He looked at the paralytic and said, son, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. But some people might say that that wasn't the same as a physical healing. And it might not be as neat to watch, right? After all, to walk again is probably what those four folks wanted for this person. And, and everyone loves a good miracle story, right? We pass those around in churches like they're candy. And we should because God is good. But the next few verses talk about how Jesus healed the man's legs also. But the Gospel of Mark makes certain that we know that the physical healing wasn't the most important thing. I'll say that part again. The physical healing was not the most important thing. That followed only after the washing away of the man's sins. First, Jesus attended to his soul. And then second... He attended to his physical malady. Here's Mark 2, 6 through 11. There's a lot up here, so I'll read it. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? I'll pause there for a minute so we catch this. We're used to this now, 2,000 years later, studying about Jesus it's, it's nothing weird for us to see uh, Jesus saying, I forgive you your sins, right? But imagine, like, uh, somebody at Casey's, you're going to get a donut and some coffee, and they turn to you and say, I, I forgive your sins, right? You'd be like, yeah, sure, okay? <laughs> so this is what it sounded like to some of the religious teachers at the time, okay? Who do you think you are, bud, forgiving people's sins? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up and take your mat and go home. So Jesus knew that the forgiveness of sins, although much more important than the physical healing, would not be enough for some people who believe only in what they can see in front of them. So he also healed the man physically. So what do we do with this lesson today? Do we shift our focus from those other things we loved back on church on Sunday morning? Do we change out that little place in our heart that desires to have this or that or that particular car or this much money or that particular job more than we want God? Yes, I think that is what we do. That is what we do with this lesson. And probably the sooner the better. One of my favorite authors and writers, C.S. Lewis, was fond of saying, if you're on the wrong path, then the faster we turn around, the quicker we end up at home, no matter how far you've gone down the wrong path. And so it's never too late to turn around and point our hearts back to God, never too late to return home. Do whatever it takes to get closer to your creator, move closer to God, even if it's through the ceiling in a thatch roof hut. But people are stubborn. We don't want to do that sometimes. We don't want to move closer to God all the time. Sometimes we want the stuff that we want. And so I'll never forget this story, and I'm sure it's burned in your brains too. Pharaoh versus Moses, right? So God says, Moses, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh so that Pharaoh hopefully will listen to me and release the people out of Egypt, out of slavery. And Moses says, you bet, I'm all for it, right? No. 
You know, Moses says, eh, can we send somebody else? Uh, I don't know if I'm good enough and all that jazz. And so Moses eventually goes to Pharaoh. But Pharaoh is stubborn. The Bible says his heart becomes hardened. And so there are 10 plagues, right? 10 plagues that falls upon Egypt because of Pharaoh's stubbornness. Blood, had to write these down because I don't want to try to memorize all of them. Frogs, lice, flies, <laughs> livestock is afflicted. Boils, if that's not bad enough, boils on people's skin. Hail to destroy housing and crops. Locusts, we remember that one. The days of darkness and the death of the firstborn. Okay? And all those times, Pharaoh says, no, no, I will not repent. No, no, no. And on down the line. And finally, when he does repent and lets the people go, he changes his mind later and comes after him over and over again. Stubborn. And we know from other parables, such as the prodigal son and the lost sheep, that God the Father will take us back immediately if we've strayed, if we're acting like Pharaoh. He'll still take us back if we repent and turn to him. He will allow us back into his good grace even after we may have allowed other things to become more important to us than they should be. He takes us back after welcoming other things into our heart when God should have been the rightful occupant in our heart. And, and what I see a lot of today, uh, now that the COVID lockdowns are over, um, I see a lot of people where work kind of sneaks in and work becomes that thing in their heart uh, that takes away time and energy and, and that starts to ebb that away from family time and, and stuff like that. Because work is a good way, uh, it's a uh, morally justifiable way uh, to do that, right? But sometimes when we idolize it, it becomes too important. We put it too high up. It's important. Our work is important. But we can't let that one sneak in either. So all of this discussion, you know, about idolatry, it can fall flat because most of us, we already know it. We've sat in church for a while, and we've had this anthem sung to us already. And so I'm going to shift gears and, and just remind people what really matters, what mattered to the four people lowering that friend through the thatch hut roof, was that nothing was going to get in the way of the face-to-face -face meeting. With Jesus, that was the single most important thing. So keep your eye fixed on that prize, fixed on Jesus, on what he did and what he said. Not on a tradition, not on church buildings, not on rituals, not on liturgy, but on Christ, Christ alone. And if you are already at home with God, then revel in that joy. You're lucky to have found that. And if you're not, then sometimes turning around immediately and heading the opposite direction to get home is the best thing to do. Rush home toward the God that will take you back, no matter how long it's been. Will you pray with me? Gracious Lord, we desire only you. So many distractions in our lives today. So many things going on in the world. Easily, we can be led astray. Shield us, Lord, from the temptation to stray toward idols. Lead us back to the heart of Christ and to adoration of him. And we pray this in Jesus' name.